There's a pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. Hello, Booktube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am with another Al Fresco Friday Reads. I don't think it's necessarily going to be the last of the year. No, but it's uh, cool. I'm in short sleeves and this might be the last short sleeved Al Fresco Friday Reads I do. But it's a beautiful day. I'm sitting in the shade so you, hopefully you can see through the trees how sunny it is out of the shade because it's a beautiful day. But I hate the sun even when the temperature is only 18 degrees. So here I am in the only shady spot that I can count on remaining shady for the duration of this Friday Reads because it's going to be a doozy, boys and girls. My husband was supposed to cut my hair last night when he got home, but I couldn't stay up late enough. I was asleep by the time he got home, so I'm uh, a little scraggly, don't you think? <laughs> I did it myself. I bought clippers at the beginning of all this coronavirus stuff so that I didn't have to go to the barber shop. And Kenji's been doing it and doing a re really nice job. But he was busy two weeks ago when I needed a haircut. I need this to be shaved off every 10 days or, or so. So I did it myself and it was okay, but I didn't do the, what do you call that? Time for a, a Kenji haircut, maybe today. Anyway, enough preamble, let's get into things. So I have one bale to tell you about, and this one made me a little bit sad, but I didn't finish The Liar's Dictionary by Ellie Williams. Ellie Williams is the author of that fabulous, wasn't it, a Republic of Consciousness Prize winning collection of short stories, A Trib, which I adored. I didn't care about this at all. I uh, read half, and Mark Nash warned me, maybe somebody else, I think Mark, maybe Mark was the only one to say he didn't think I would finish, and as usual, Mark was right. Yeah, a, a twee, it was supposed to be funny, I didn't find it funny. There was one strand of the narrative which was about the, one of the main characters' closeted lesbian identity that I cared about, but that was dipped into so rarely, and this was preoccupied by and structured by dictionary making and etymology and I just didn't care. I love words, I love etymology and it has to be connect. Words have to make meaning in this there was nothing meaningful or interesting about this silly story for me. So I didn't finish it. It's got lovely end papers but that's about it. I have finished four. I finished Elizabeth Jane Howard's 1956 novel, The Long View, and this would be a contender for top read of the year. What an exquisite, powerful novel. I loved it with all my heart. I'm going to do a full review. There's so many canonical mid-20th century British writers that are absolute crap and we're not all reading Elizabeth Jane Howard. I'm going to do my small piece to change that. This was utterly compelling. It's the book that Leah, my buddy reader friend in Calgary, and I both felt in such an intense way. Loved it! Stay tuned for my review. And then those of you who pay an inordinate amount of attention to my book hauls, you might remember that I got the idea for reading this novel because of this single volume essay about it. Kate Briggs's entertaining ideas the long view and she is a writer she has published stuff with that what's the name of that pedantic uh, uh, aesthetic free no name brand publishing house Fitzcarraldo <laughs> she publishes stuff with them so that I'm already suspicious and this is from another MA bibliotech and it's her very specially laid out essay on the book this was the shittiest piece of crap I've read this year. I hated it so much it was just pedantic garbage. I learned one interesting fact uh, in it that I could have stumbled upon in Wikipedia. The rest of it was hooey. What a joke. So you don't need to bother with this, boys and girls. But do, do check out Elizabeth Jane Howard's The Long View. I was shocked by how much I ended up hating 
A Kweke Ameze is the death of Vivek Oji. It started out really strong, and by the end I was hate reading it. It was so stupid. What a disappointment. But most writers' second novels are crap. This was crap. I did it as a buddy read with Lindsay's, and she did not think it was crap. So please check out her channel for a much more positive view of this book. The book has star rating in the four point something range, and I just thought it was a complete and utter failure. And I guess I'll talk about it for a few minutes because I'm not going to do a full review. I wish Akweke Emeze well with their future writing endeavors because Freshwater was my top read of a couple years ago. This would be near the bottom of my reads for 2020. Two stars. I won't talk about it in a spoilery way, but what made me hate this novel was the obtuseness of Emeze's choices about what to withhold from the reader. And so the secrets all came out in the last 20 pages and I was angry because what was the point in withholding that stuff? They finally begin to treat their main theme in the last 20 pages of the book, by which point I was like, what a fucking manipulation that was of my valuable reading time. Yeah, it just made me angry. That, that's enough. Uh, uh, other people liked it. Great. I thought it stunk. On a much, much happier note, after many, many months of buddy reading this with Sonia of An Enthusiastic Reader, we have finally finished A Fanatic Heart by Edna O'Brien. Her selected short stories published maybe in the 90s, mid 80s, published in the mid 80s. So she's probably written a whole swack of short stories since then. Am I gonna do, no, I'm not gonna do a full review of this because I don't know how to review a short story collection, but Sonia and I are going to have a Zoom chat about it, focusing on one story in particular, and we're going to give you advance notice. We're going to choose a story that's also available online, if possible, so that you can kind of join in the discussion and talk a bit about why we love this so much. This is one of the best short story collections I have ever read, especially of that length. The stories that I loved the most were about, obviously based on O'Brien's childhood in Ireland, and the ways that her protagonists as very young girls and or young women uh, tried to connect with men romantically and sexually and uh, women in, on the level of friendship that uh, often had a sexual element as well. And those stories just... That's what happens when I stay in bed an extra hour. Tokyo, pretty noisy at eight o'clock in the morning. Did I finish that thought? Um, th oh, that's what I, uh, those stories burned so brightly that even when that theme was explored in maybe 10 of the stories in here, each one felt so individual and unique. Oh, oh, oh. So many of the short stories in here were incredibly powerful, a five star read. The other theme that she explores that make up maybe a third of the stories, maybe less, maybe a quarter of the stories, is desperate women in the throes of adulterous relationships. And those, I thought, were boring. Well written, but she gets into the emotional yearnings of that and the sc how screwed up the women were. And that got old for me. But the majority of the stories are not focused on that, but that theme is kind of boring to me. Um, I don't think anybody else has probably explored it with such fictional ferocity as Edna O'Brien does in these stories, but uh, I could have done with maybe quite a few less, quite a few fewer of them. So anyway, what delightful. Go Edna. So that's what I finished. So that was a bit of a mixed bag, but some of my top reads of the year were in that bag. So that was pretty awesome, I think. Of the many books that I've started, I'm not even gonna count, but maybe six or something, eight. Let me deal with the non-Victober stuff first. I did start Janet Frames towards another summer, the novel that she wrote in the early 60s that she felt was so personally revealing, so autobiographical that she didn't allow it to be published in her lifetime. So thus it was published posthumously. And I think I love it. I certainly love the first couple chapters. I identify so strongly with the protagonist who is self-conscious, awkward, 
and thus doesn't do well in social situations that I'm not sure I'm going to allow this Friday Reads to be published until after my death. <laughs> I love her. She's a nov The protagonist is a New Zealander novelist living in London, which was Janet Frame's situation. I am not a novelist, but everything else about her personality I relate to to a painful degree. <laughs> Um, the writing is beautiful. What I'm not yet sure about, I am about 100 pages in, so I'm about halfway through, is there are shifts in tone that I'm not sure about, where there are pages where it's almost surreal, uh, kind of dreamlike, uh, where the protagonist is imagining that she's a bird, and juxtaposed a little bit jarringly with more realistic social experience. I'm not sure where I will end up coming down on that point, but I'm really, really enjoying it. So, beautiful prose. And Joe Smith and I have got a bear start on our buddy read of Burnt Sugar by Avni Doshi. Doshi is the Japanese word for verb, if you didn't know. And so we've just done the first 20 pages, and I loved the first 20 pages. I'm completely hooked by the storyline. It's about a I think in the present of the novel, the protagonist is middle-aged and her elderly mother has some kind of dementia, I don't know if it's Alzheimer's, and is losing her memory. And she had been an, abuse, an abusive mother, but she has forgotten all of that. And where does that leave the narrator, who I think is the only child? And then what I really enjoyed in the last chapter or so was the way that her, the narrator's character, was complicated she reveals how she tried to control her husband in the early days of the marriage and that all fits with somebody coming from an abusive background and a, who was abused as a child perhaps but it just made the story that much more complex right out of the gate so i can't wait to continue with this so now on to victober victober started yesterday and my victober has started out so fabulously that i'm just gonna I've only read the first chapter of most of the books that I'm going to tell you about because I just started yesterday. And despite some of my fellow booktubers' negativity about my TBR, they're all starting out good and I know that the first chapter is not a good indication because most first chapters are great, even in crappy books or maybe especially in crappy books. So there's lots of time for things to go south, but wow, I had such uh, an exuberant day of reading yesterday. So in no particular order, here's what I've started, and I'm gonna just explain how the, each of these books opens. If that crow will let me. I have started Cranford by Elizabeth Gaskell, and it took a little while to get into the first chapter. It's like a wee narrator, and the, the, the eye is rarely individuated out of that wee. So it's set in this community, Cranford, and who's allowed in and who is kept on the outside told mostly through we and I had to get used to that but no I found it really charming the first chapter and funny I don't remember much humor in what I've read of Gaskell but uh, maybe I'm not remembering but uh, yeah I thought it was sweet I think my Sunday sentence is going to be from here about all of the ladies most it was the, the town is it a town I guess it's a town um, is the residents are mostly ladies that don't like really having men in the community and a few of them are married but their husbands only come home from London or somewhere on the weekend set in the mid 19th century I think and none of them are rich they're aristocratic but they don't have any money and the way that they compensate for that and allow for that and refuse to talk about money and there's a sentence where they're at one of the neighbors house for tea and she has to get down on her hands and knees and pull the, the tea set out from under the sofa and they all just pretend that this is completely normal and uh, I like the way it's starting out. I have also started Queen Victoria by Lytton Strachey and uh, anything about Queen Victoria. I could give five stars to the Wikipedia entry about Queen Victoria and I have decided now that I'm going to read a book about Queen Victoria every year during Victoria because I have only read about 10 pages of this and what I loved was that the story opens with a Princess Charlotte dying in 1817 and that was let's see if I can keep the get the details George the fourth who was not yet king his father George the third was still king but Prince George was regent 
and his daughter, his only daughter, died in childbirth. And that's how Queen Victoria ended up coming to the throne because there weren't any other direct descendants of George III. So then it went to George IV, and then his brother William IV, and then he... All the times that I have to pause for garbage trucks and big trucks to go by, and this is not like a, these are small little residential streets, but every 45 seconds I've got to stop for 45 seconds whilst another vehicle goes by. And that one's just gonna park right outside and idle. Oh, it stopped, okay. And she died in childbirth. She married Prince Leopold of Saxe-Coburg, and that is the family where Prince Albert came from. And just the way it's written, I maybe learned new things or reread some of the same information that seems new to me every time I read it, because there's usually five or ten years in between each of my Queen Victoria biographies. And I, I'm just geeking out people. Oh my god. That's starting out great as well. And I do have to say that contrary to the low expectations that I and my subscribers perceived in my TBR, I like the way this novel has started out. Mrs. Humphrey Ward's Hellbeck of Bannisdale. The writing is nothing special, but the story is set up in a way that I am uh, totally pulled in. Admittedly, the chapter opens with way too much description of the trees and the river and stuff, and I did end up scanning a fair bit of that. But at the same time, we meet Halbeck, and he is waiting for his sister to arrive, from whom he has been estranged by his own choice for 17 years. He is now in his late 30s. But he ostracized her when she married outside of the Catholic faith. And she moved away. And now, 17, I think it's 17 years later, he has invited her to come and live with him because she is in very poor health and a widow. And she brings with her her 17 or 18 year old stepdaughter, whose name I think is Laura. And Halbeck, he's. He seems 80 because he's so uh, set in his ways, but you can see that he, at least he has a basic humanity, that he's welcoming his sister back. She seems 90. She's so ill. And then the stepdaughter, who I'm assuming is going to fall in love with Halbeck. She is feisty, independent, and just lights up every room she walks in. And that was all conveyed really well. And it's the ancestral probably Bannisdale House or something where, that Halbeck lives that he's welcomed, very awkwardly welcomed these two women into that is described. I like that description of the house better than the nature around the house and all the history. There was Catholic martyrs and stuff. Yeah, so far, I, I mean, I am not going to sit here and say this is going to be a five-star read because that would be silly. I'm Sean the Book Maniac, but the first chapter really did hook me. And the other two that I've started for Victober, one was Vanity Fair by Thackeray. And oh my god, I read the first chapter on my exercise bike yesterday morning. It was a long chapter, and by the time I finished, you know, 20 pages or something, and by the time I finished it, I, I had completed 1% of this novel. So it is a huge novel. and. It's one of the best opening chapters to a novel that I've read in a long time. So good. I didn't expect to love the writing as much as I do. So let me tell you how it opens. It's not a spoiler to tell you about the first chapter, right? It's a finishing school. I believe it's in London. And two 17 or 18 year old girls are quote unquote graduating, leaving the school. The headmistress is a prissy, arrogant idiot. And her younger sister is a little more humane than her, she, and they both are the administration of this finishing school. And Amelia was the star pupil, the valedictorian. She was she's beautiful and smart and every popular. And she gets sent off with what most students who graduate receive as a gift from the laughably pompous, prim headmistress, uh, their own copy of Samuel Johnson's dictionary, because Samuel Johnson had some connection to the school. And she is sent off and she's expected to make somebody a really cultured wife. Going with her is Becky Sharp, and Becky Sharp doesn't get a dictionary, and she is the scapegoat of the school. She is not from a rich family. 
she got her foot in the door there through her father who was poor but had been teaching French I think at the school or something but everybody hates her the headmistress hates her she is uh, feisty and angry and uh, full of vim and vigor the prim headmistress's younger sister feels really bad that her older sister isn't going to give Becky a dictionary. It's going to look so bad that she's going to be standing right there when Amelia gets a dictionary. So after an extremely cold goodbye that the headmistress gives Becky, after showering Amelia in affection, they both are getting into the carriage because Becky is being sent home to stay with Amelia and her family for a couple weeks before her governess's job starts. So they're both getting into the same carriage. The younger sister of the headmistress runs out secretly and gives Becky her own Johnson's Dictionary. And as the carriage is pulling away, Becky throws it into the, into the street. She doesn't want it. So that's how the first chapter opens. It's like, oh my god, I love these people. I love these characters. I love the way this story is starting out. I've read one more chapter, which I won't tell you about, because that might be wading into spoiler territory. But what a... A fantastic opening to a novel. I am loving it. And the last one that I've started for Victober is Red Pottage by Mary Chumley. And it also started out really invitingly. I didn't know what to expect, but I was pleasantly surprised by how drawn in I was to the story. So I don't remember any, but oh, there's a guy starting up some home carpentry project behind me now. I'm not moving, so I'm just going to, hopefully he <laughs> lets me finish. Um, I don't remember any characters' names, so let me just say that in the first chapter, we meet a man who's on his way to a party at the home of a married couple, and she's having a love affair with the woman, and he wants to break it off. He is single, as far as I understand it. So he goes to the party, and greets the wife who is you know upper class and I think he's maybe upper middle class like her husband is lord something or something so it's awkward the husband who The husband, who of course we assume to be a buffoon, that his wife is carrying on a love affair under his nose, and he's friends with the man. But then the scene shifts immediately to that cuckolded husband greeting an old college chum, I think, school chum that he hasn't seen in years, that somehow finagled an invitation to this party of Lord so-and-so's, not realizing that Lord so-and-so was his old chum. And the way they talk, this cuckolded husband dude who wasn't a lord or maybe a sir I don't you know aristocratic terms doesn't matter but he's he's elevated socially maybe through the marriage to his wife he's no dummy and he I liked him watching him talk to his old school chum they were both really bad when they were younger and the way they talk about it it's really inviting it's really I, I, I really enjoyed that section meanwhile the man who's having an affair with the married woman is standing at the party and falls in love with somebody named Rachel. I do remember her name. Ugh. Just let me freaking finish filming my Friday reads, people. He notices a woman standing off by herself and he falls head over heels in love with her at first sight. And I think that's where the story is going to go. Rachel West seems like she's going to be a central character in the story. And at the end of the party, the cuckolded man asks the man, his friend, who's sleeping with his wife, to come into his uh, growlery, his den, for a chat. And is very friendly, and they go in, and he shows him two straws. And he said, we're going to draw straws. Whoever gets the shorter one... I had to look this part up because I wasn't sure if I was remembering correctly, but the Lord Newhaven is the, the cuckolded husband and he says, I'll read you the paragraph of his, what he says. I'm sorry the idea is not my own. I read it in a magazine. Though comparatively modern, it promises soon to become as customary as the much to be regretted pistols for two and coffee for four. 
I hold the lighters thus, and you draw. Whoever draws or keeps the short one is pledged to leave this world within four months, or shall we say five on account of the pheasant shooting? Five be it. Is it agreed? Just so. Will you draw? So the man who we meet at the opening of the chapter who's sleeping with Lord Newhaven's wife realizes in an instant that Lord Newhaven actually does know that he is sleeping with Lady Newhaven, very nervously draws a straw, and the way the chapter ends, he gets the shorter. So I don't know what it means to pledge to leave this world. Does it mean leave the city, leave the country, kill himself? I'm not sure, but boy, that got my attention. Starting out good. That's what I have started. And I think I've been filming this Friday Reads for three hours because of all the traffic noise I've had to pause for. So let me quickly finish up and say that in the coming week, I will be starting at least three books. I have two more Victober books to start. One is George Eliot's Felix Holt, The Radical, which I'm looking forward to uh, getting into. It's a chunky one. And of course, the gay brothel novel from the 1880s or whatever, Sins of the Cities of the Plain by Jack Saul. Stay tuned. And something decidedly non-Victorian, a gay novel out of America by a Polish-American writer, Swimming in the Dark by Tomasz Jadrowski. This will be a buddy read with Ollie Bliss, and we will be starting that in the coming week. I haven't heard a lot about it, but what I've heard is that it's pretty good. So, have you seen the cover long enough? Can I put it down now? So what do you think? How's that for a doozy of a reading week? Hope your reading week has been doozy-ish as well. Thanks for watching. Hello, this is a homoerotic addendum to my Friday reads. I wish to hell that I didn't have... I don't have much of a sense of ethics about filming or photographing hot guys in public, but uh, I couldn't do it this time, so let me just describe what I saw walking home. I walked home through at 9 o'clock. It's now 9.20 a.m., and if I'm out of breath, it's not just because I was carrying the heavy books, people. Oh, my God. So I was walking to the brand new park, new as of last year. There's many big benches, and that park, I don't like filming there. I can't film there most mornings because there's nothing blocking the sun. So I saw that somebody lying stretched out with their head on their backpack on one of the large benches. And as I'm walking toward him, I'm far enough away. That I, is he wearing tan colored clothes or is he sunbathing? Is that his skin? Is that his tan skin? And I thought, oh, well, even if it is, it's probably some ugly old guy. And I got closer. Oh my god! 25 years old, built like a brick shit house, wearing, I don't know if it was underwear or some kind of short, 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 skimpy sh black shorts that left nothing to the imagination. There was quite a bit to be left to the imagination. <laughs> Sun tanning, virtually naked, bronzed, just lying there demurely eyes closed and I couldn't bring myself to even walk any closer to him than my path would have taken me but I got an eyeful before I was done boys and girls <laughs> I kept saying Sean go back open your open your iPad and just press record and just walk by and pretend you're pretend you're talking on the phone hello yeah 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 blah, 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 blah. but no I, I didn't so it's just in here and now it's on here now the reason that I'm actually, aside to, from just just showing you how, how flabbergasted, how flustered I am by what I just saw, is to point out, and I mentioned it actually a couple weeks ago on a Friday Reads when I saw a, a runner or a jogger take off his shirt. You rarely see men with their shirts off. And for this guy to be sunbathing, like if this was in Canada or America, uh, I mean, I would still enjoy the view, but I wouldn't be shocked. I was utterly shocked. I've never seen... Now, and I don't go to beaches. I'm sure it happens on a beach, but in public, in a park, like, it's not against the law, but it's so outside of the culture for men to expose their bodies like that. Oh, my God. I need a cigarette. Thankfully, I quit smoking five years ago or something, but oh, my God. I'm just in a tizzy. Thanks for watching. Thank you.